Hey guys, how's it going? Well, uh, firstly, I would like to say thank you very much. I just discovered that I have 103 subscribers. I've managed to go into triple digits in a year and a half. No, two and a half years, almost. Um, which totally blows me away. Makes me think that perhaps I'm not the only sad git that likes this stuff out there. Not that I'm suggesting you guys are sad gits, of course, but... Uh, as I say in all my videos, I appreciate the comments. Um, you guys have picked up in that regard, and I find it really exciting to see everybody interacting. Um, so, please continue. Thank you much. Uh, a few weeks ago, okay, a few months ago, I mentioned that I thought that I would quite like to put together a Z80 computer. I've never actually done this before. My dad did it when he was in his 30s, and... Um, I thought that that was the most amazing thing when I was younger, so I figured I should give it a try. It's not actually that complicated. Uh, it's one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older, which kind of takes the mystique out of it. But uh, he was working with a whole lot more complicated things like dynamic RAM and such like that, and all of the timing circuitry, and or the timing for the circuitry, which I'm going to totally slack out and not do, because most of the ICs I'm planning on using are going to be so fast that the Z80 is going to be the slow part of the circuit. But, anyway, I digress. So I thought I'd like to do it, and I figured, why not the lot of us do it together? What we have here is the bare essential that's required to fire up a Z80. Uh, I actually had an idea in my head of how I wanted this to um, go together, to put together a tester circuit, you know, just make sure that I wasn't smoking crack and what I thought it should do, it would do. And as I was groping around the internet for some data sheets and schematics and the like, I came across a site um, by a fellow by the name of Thomas Shearer, and it's z80.info, and it's a fantastic site. It truly is the Bible of this sort of thing. And they have a minimum tester circuit, so I totally cheated, and I've ripped the circuit off pretty much. I thought that I would begin with a bit of a description on the Z80 itself. Uh, Z80 is produced by a company called Zilog, which was started by an ex-Intel engineer back in 74. Uh, this is their first major product, the Z80, or Z80 for the Americans. And uh, the Z80 was an 8080, that's Intel 8080, software-compatible chip, which came out in mid-1976. Now, not only did it come out as a compatible chip, uh, but it pretty much usurped the market because it was better in almost every respect. It was faster. It had a more useful and more helpful instruction set. It had uh, more registers. It had duplicate registers, which meant instead of having to, every time you did a function, push everything onto the stack and pop it back, you could actually switch the registers around, which made it really handy. Um, it had um, more interrupt levels. Oh, what else? Um, oh, talk about simpler. So the 8080 required minus 5 volts, plus 5 volts, and plus 12 volts. This simply requires plus 5. The 8080 required a two-phase plus 12 volt clock source. This is a single-phase plus 5 volt clock source. Everything is much, much easier to deal with with the Z80. Uh, and as well as that, it also had uh, DRAM, DRAM or a dynamic, dan, bleh, dynamic RAM refresh built in. So instead of having to, um, you know, put your uh, processor and then have the dynamic RAM refresh circuitry uh, beside it, this packaged it all together, which was again less things you had to have, less things you had to deal with, which is fantastic. I don't actually have the numbers to back it up, but I'm confident to say that this is probably the longest-lived microprocessor around. Uh, the Intel series, the 4004, the 4040, the 8080, um, they, they're not made anymore. They make 6502s, um, sort of. The last 6502 rolled off the line in 1990-something, but Western Digital... Uh, makes a software compatible version 68020 I think or whatever the latest release is however this Z80 is the same Z80 pretty much um, since 
its introduction in 1976. And when I say pretty much, the original version was clocked at 2.5 megahertz, and during its lifespan, they've managed to bring it up to 20 megahertz. So that's pretty much the only difference. This version here is a 10 megahertz version. They actually have a newer architecture, which is the EZ80, uh, which runs anywhere from 33 to 50 megahertz, and is again, as far as I'm aware, software compatible with the Z80, which is pretty magic. The Z80s are phenomenally ubiquitous. I mean, a friend of mine and I were discussing today that it's kind of a shame that they brought out the Z80. It was so much better than the 8080. It was so much friendlier and nicer for developers and hardware people. And they kind of rested on their laurels and they focused on dumping out production. They have had some uh, other products, but... They never really pushed on development like Intel did and then later AMD did. Um, if they had, maybe Zilog processors would be in you know, your Macs and your Dells these days instead of Intels. Hard to say. But uh, in the old days, you got uh, the Z80 in, the Osborne one, K-Pro, the Trash 80. <laughs> uh, the Commodore 128 had one in it, uh, along with its 8502. The ZX Spectrum for the Brits. Uh, hell, the Sega Mega System had one. Or sorry, the Sega Master System had one. And the Game Boy. So, I mean, in the old days, they were everywhere. Um, but, even today, and this is, I think, what really makes this an amazing processor, is that it is still everywhere. In my little bucket, I'll get some pieces here. Which is just some... Um, Processors or chips rather that I've pulled out of various things that I've torn apart. I've got five or six Z80s and I've pulled them out of printers. I think I got one from a UPS. Uh, they put Z80s in everything. They put them in um, Sega, used them as hard disk controllers at one point, or at least helpers to hard disk controllers. Uh, printers, like I mentioned, PBXs, cash registers, Texas Instruments used them for their graphing calculators. They were in, um, oh, in the old days, arcade games. Uh, they've been in audio synthesizers. If you can find a product that uses any kind of embedded controller, whether a microprocessor or a microcontroller, you can guarantee that at some point in its lifespan, if not continuously, They've been Z80s in the line. It's incredible. So, it, it really, um, historically, an amazing processor. So this is, uh, like I said, my test system, slightly modified from Mr. Shearer's version. We have the uh, Z80 itself is here, this big one. This is a 40-pin package dip. We have the clock circuit here. We've got some lights on the address bus, data lines, and then the power circuitry here. Um, my wall wart, my power pack, is a 9 volt DC unit. So we have a regulator to bring it down to 5 volts, which is what the TTR runs off, and then a couple capacitors to smooth the signal out. We have uh, a couple signals tied. Um, first of all, we have uh, what are these? We've got. Oh, uh, this is interrupt and NMI, non-maskable interrupt. There's actually two lines here, although there's only one wire going in because I've joined them with a jumper here. Uh, on this side, these two yellow ones here, there is wait and bus request. Uh, wait puts the processor into a holding state, and then bus request is used for DMA transfers. If you assert bus request, it actually turns the processor off. So obviously we want that tied in a low state, so that or an off state rather, so that we know um, the processor is not going to hang on something. Now these are all active low signals, which means that when a zero or a low voltage is passed on, they are active, and so when they are tied high, in this case, to the plus 5 volt rail, then they are disabled. We've got our power here and ground, which is this one here. The data lines on this I have all tied to um, the low voltage, the zero, and I'll explain that in a second. I've got the least significant bits, the least four significant bits of the address bus going to these LEDs here. This is my reset circuit. 
uh, and it's not much of a circuit. All it's doing is it's tying it high. This again is another active low line. So if it's high, the reset is off. I thought I'd explain a little bit about the basics of how this all works. I apologize if you are familiar with all this stuff and it's old hat. Feel free to skip ahead. Uh, hopefully I'm not going to bore anybody by starting at the basics. The um, We have address lines on one side and data lines on the other. So the address lines are used by the processor to address memory or I.O. devices. The data lines, obviously, as the name might suggest, is used for pushing data back and forth between those devices. The address lines are an out only, so it's the process asserting that it wants that address from whatever device that, that address points to. And then the data line is in only. It No, I'm sorry, the data line is bidirectional. God, good grief. Uh, so you could write to memory by asserting the address of the memory cell on the address bus. You would flip on the write and memory request lines and then you would punch the data bytes out on the bus. Uh, and you synchronize between the various devices by using the clock source, which is this here. We'll get to this in a second. Now I've drawn a little diagram to give us a basic uh, function here and bear with me I know that I am not much of a uh, how do I say it it's not as clear as it could be but bear with me oops so we have our address lines there are 16 address lines on the Z80 even though there are only 8 data lines so it has an 8-bit data bus and a 16-bit address bus the address lines are from A0 to A15, A0 being the least significant bit of the address line. These are active high signals. So when, a, um, when it wants to assert a bit, it will bring it to a high voltage state, which in the case of the Z80 is, or TTL logic, is plus 5 volts or thereabouts. And if it's an active, or in a low state, or a zero bit, then it would be, usually they're run between half volt to uh, 1.25 volts, I think. Um, so say that we're doing a memory request, which is what I've got here. The first thing the processor would do would be it would put the address on the bus. So say we're going to pull up cell 181 in decimal. 181 in decimal is this in binary, 000, 0000, 0000, 1011, 0101. Take my word for it. So, from the least significant bit, it would put A0 high for 1, A1 low for 0, A2 high for 1, 0, 1, 1, so on, so on, so on. So it will put this address on the bus. It will then assert read, which is an active low state. That's what the line above the signal name means, is that it's active low. And then it will assert memory request. And that means that it's trying to access the memory, at which point the memory would become active because the memory request line and the read lines will be multiplexed to a chip enable uh, selector on the memory chip and it'll see this address on the address bus which it's going to look for immediately when it gets enabled and it will simply look up that cell in its memory and return on the data bus. 